Welcome to Zero Knowledge. I'm your host, Anna Rose. In this podcast, we will be exploring the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web, as well as new paradigms that promise to change the way we interact and transact online. This week, I dive into Halo 2 with Dara and Strad, two cryptographic engineers at the Electric Coin Company. We explore the new ideas that Halo had introduced and how Halo 2 built on these ideas, adding optimizations such as plonkish arithmetization to take what was a breakthrough technology to a production-ready proving system. Before we start in, I want to suggest you check out the ZK Whiteboard Sessions, a new content series focused on ZK education. It consists of a series of videos that look at the building blocks of ZK. We already have six modules live. This would be a great place for you to learn about the topics we talk about in this episode, as well as give you the foundations to think about ZK research. I've added the link in the show notes. Be sure to check it out and do join the ZK Hack Discord if you want to join study clubs or any other activity we have coming around the series. Also, if you're looking to work in the field of ZK, be sure to check out the ZK Jobs Board. There you find ZK-focused jobs from top teams in the space. We're in the midst of getting a lot of new jobs added there at the moment with the run-up to the ZK Summit, so do check it out. Now, Tanya will share a little bit about this week's sponsor. Today's episode is sponsored by Manta Network. Manta is a privacy hub for Web3. By leveraging zero-knowledge proofs, Manta brings on-chain privacy to any crypto asset. Manta Pay, which is their first app, allows users to privately swap crypto assets cross-chain. Manta is also hiring. They're looking for skilled developers and engineers passionate about cryptography and passionate about bringing privacy protection services to all of Web3. Manta is remote first, backed by teams like Polychain, Binance, and other industry leaders. Check out careers.manta.network to apply. So thanks again, Manta. Now here's Anna's episode on Halo 2. So today, I'm sitting here live with Dara and Strad, both cryptographic engineers at the Electric Coin Company. Welcome to the show. Lovely to be here. Yeah, it's great to be here. So Dara, this is your second time on the show. That's we right. did an episode in 2020 where we talked about Halo 1, I guess, Halo Original. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very excited with this episode to kind of continue on that and explore Halo 2 and what's coming up. Strad, this is the first time you're on the show, yeah, that's, but it's, uh... <laughs> it's not the first time we've had, we've been able to kind of work together. You were the first speaker at the first ZK Summit in March 2018. Did ZK Summit even know it was going to turn into this at that time? It did not. It, 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 ZK Summit, <laughs> Zero Knowledge Summit was actually the conference around this podcast that we had named Zero Knowledge. <laughs> and Howard Wu and yourself brought your friends, brought your knowledge, and turned the ZK Summit proposal into a proper ZK Summit. I'm sorry for your loss. <laughs> <laughs> What's wild is, do you remember that first talk? It was, I mean, it, high level. Yeah, it I was, was I, like, I was where's doing Waldo? My, I was doing my best to be like, cool, um, I'm going to assume literally nothing <laughs> yes. and do the simplest explanation I can to give an intuition. And then Howard follows up with his talk and I'm like the deepest cool. snarks <laughs> yeah and I'm just going right we've really like we've we've covered a, the full gamut I am sure they are gobsmacked but we do we needed that I mean at the time the knowledge about zero knowledge was quite like sparse there was maybe a few mm. people in that crowd who were well versed but and it was wild to see ZK Summit like one after another and now I don't know if you know this but we're doing ZK Summit 8 mm. in Berlin in September so the 8th edition but ZK Summit is not the only event focused on this kind of tech. ZCon is as well. And we are actually recording this at ZCon 3, which is very cool to actually get to see everyone again in person. I did do an episode on ZCon 0, which was like this combo episode. Mm. I, I think I interviewed something like 15 people and spliced it together. It was a lot of work. <laughs> it was really cool, though. It's a little snapshot into like the world um, and what things were happening. I'm going to add all of these to the show notes, including the video from the first CK Summit. And I hope people will check that out. Yeah, it was a, it was a good time. It was the, it, you know, because the, the foundation had not long really sort of gotten off the off the ground. And it was sort of its first big event. Mm -hmm. And the first time really that uh, a lot of the wider ecosystem had been able to get together. Because prior to that, it was most of the 
in-person events had been either just ECC themselves or ECC like hosting something in in a place for a few people to to come along like things were growing but like this was sort of the first like major zcash addressed but also like zero knowledge focused conference mm-hmm. that was like for the wider community um i mean there was also other things going on like the you know the zk proofs workshop and stuff mm-hmm. which were more geared at like the theoreticians and the implementers and things directly but this was uh, some like standardization yeah and, exactly but it, this was sort of like the first like Zero knowledge is fun. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it. Totally. Yeah, I remember it was in Montreal and it was um, in the middle of a heat wave. And I hadn't realized that Canada had heat waves, but yeah, it was was really It's not what one associates with them. Although I will correct you, Strat, the um, first CK Summit actually happened before ZCon. Oh. Zero. So I think I'm, so I've been kind of claiming the first a little <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll give you that no, you're right. you were at it you were the first talk at the first that, that is fair i i will i will give you that it was different though because yeah. at the time the zk summit was also just partly zero knowledge focused and partly yeah. blockchain it, general yeah it was yeah. yeah it was it was a very um fruitful time in terms of like giving giving rise to some very awesome um events to uh cool. to, for the space So I want to hear a little, I think it would be really great to introduce both of you a bit more to the audience. Dara, you've already been on the show, and we have heard on that episode kind of more of your backstory. But yeah, say kind of who you are and what you work on at Electric Coin Company. Yeah, um, so I'm the lead author of the Zcash protocol specification. Um, I do a lot of work with uh, on Zcash D with core team, a lot of documentation and protocol design. Very cool. And since we're going to be talking a lot about Halo 2, what's the role there? So I'm a co-author on the original Halo paper. I invented, discovered, whatever, um, developed the um, pasta curves. So this this um, construction for curve cycles um, that allows recursion um, in Halo and um, hopefully will allow us to use recursion in Zcash and we, we have some other collaborations, for example, with Filecoin and the Ethereum Foundation um, that were also developing recursion mm. for those. You were sort of saying like you might have discovered. It's either developed or discovered, but discovered almost sounds like it like emerges. It's always yeah, been my, there. I like my, that. Math has always been there. It, it, it is discovered. And, it, and it's also a social construction, That's like so many cool. things. Mm-hmm. Okay, Strad, tell us a little bit about your story and kind of like what led you to the work that you do today. Well, I got bored one day um, and ended up doing network privacy on the side of my regular day job, which wasn't a job. It was being a student and going through the the university pipeline, you know, um, bachelor's, master's, PhD. And that was, that was the track I was on. And then at some point, I think it was, um, yeah, it was in Real World Crypto 2014, um, was sort of the first like in-person event I'd gone to after having spent a lot of time sort of online in the privacy space. And that's actually where I met Dara and um, Zuko. And I think Nathan was there, Brian Warner, some 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 very fun people. Yeah. Um, met them in person and actually also listened to Matt Green give the Zero Cash talk. Nice. Um, and yeah, you know, didn't think anything more about cryptocurrency at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that was sort of the connection was made. And then a couple of years later, when I was finishing my PhD, um, yeah, Zuko approached me and asked me if he if I could um, potentially put a little bit of my time towards um, working on this uh, cool new zero knowledge proof circuitry stuff. Yeah. And what what would you say? Like, what what are you focused on? What's your day to day? What kind of projects are you mostly looking at? So I was roped in by the enticement of zero knowledge proofs. Um, I spent a lot of my initial years working on not that. <laughs> um, I did a lot of the the base engineering for for Zcash D and um, and just like general engineering with the other with the rest of core team on you know the wallet and the and the base layer. You know I. I implemented the proof of work system mm. after you know figuring things out in terms of what we we're going to do with um, with Dara and and then yeah I 
I slowly wormed my way from that into the cryptography side um, because I've just been able to be around so many amazing people um, and learn from them and and gain experience from them. <laughs> I have a very memorable experience of in early 2017. I was at um, CCC, so sorry the the Congress event that CCC runs mm. in uh, Hamburg, in Leipzig, Leipzig. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Maybe it was there I, that I think year, it was but... Leipzig. No, at the time it was Hamburg. Okay. They've ended Leipzig for a few. They've actually, um, ah, they're now true, back true. at Hamburg because they've uh, finished the renovations. Oh, cool. So I was there um, and Zuko was there and we were talking to someone and they're like, oh, Zuko, you should come to our thing and give a talk about how um, zero knowledge proofs work, how, how Zcash works. And he was like, oh, no, that's okay. I'm, I'm a bit too busy. And I'm there going, sure, I'll do it. Nice. It was, so I was like, cool, I'm going to give a talk about how zero knowledge proofs work in three weeks. <laughs> Types on uh, the messenger. Sean, <laughs> how does zero knowledge proofs work? <laughs> and I proceeded to pester my colleague Sean Bow and Iran Troma, who was one of the seven scientists, and were both in the messenger, you know, for for ECC uh, for the next three weeks, wow. and wrote a talk. And yeah, that it's a was good way to learn quick. The, yes, <laughs> De- deadlines are so they they focus the mind so much. So Very much. Um, yeah. So. Since then, yeah, I've done more with Sapling. Like I, I helped more with the Sapling protocol and and doing bits of design there. And uh, was very involved in the in the Orchard protocol, cool. uh, cryptographic design and implementation. I just realized I just double checked something. You have been on the show before. You were in the combo episode of oh. Zcon Zero, and I just was I just opened it in the browser and was like, oh, so small correction. <laughs> but I, I I'm happy you shared with us a little bit more. I think those were quite short back then. So I want to sort of direct us now towards Halo. I mean, here at ZCon 3, we've, I think I've seen two, at least two talks focused on that. Maybe there was a couple more. Uh, I, yeah, my but, talk was on uh, analysis of the Shielded Protocol. Okay. Yeah, I gave a talk on, um, well, Halo 2, but focused on the performance aspects of it, mm-hmm. um, and particularly around the elements of the Halo 2 proving system and the, the things it's built on, and also our implementation of it that help us to leverage the performance and, and build performance circuits. Mm. Um, and then my colleague Ying Tong gave a uh, presentation on the ecosystem and what other people have been doing um, with the with Halo 2. Yeah, very cool. I want to, in the start of this, like because we've done an episode that did talk about that initial Halo kind of breakthrough um, and the history kind of leading up to Halo, I'm going to obviously put that in the show notes for anyone who wants to hear that. But in this one, I sort of want to revisit some of the concepts that we introduced in that episode and then talk about Halo 2. I also am kind of doing this selfishly because we're doing the ZK Whiteboard series where we're kind of covering a lot of basic building blocks. I'm not the host. I'm watching Brendan host. And I realize that I'm missing some kind of general vocabulary sometimes to follow exactly what is being said. Mm. So I was hoping yeah, we could do some of these. So... And then you can tell me, I want to understand what they are, and then you can tell me how they all kind of weave together in Halo. So one of them was the inner product argument. I was very curious, like, what is an inner product argument? So are you familiar with a dot product? I am not. Excellent. Let's start there. (laughs) Um, So if you think of having a a vector, are you familiar with a vector? I am familiar with a vector, linear Um, algebra. Cool. Hurrah. So, so if you if you take a vector, and we take a pair of vectors, and um, the dot product is where you take like each element in the vector pairwise. So the first the first in each vector, then the second in each vector. You multiply each of the pairs, and then you add all of the um, the resulting sums together, okay. and you end up with a single value at the end that represents the dot product of the vectors. So. Like, it would it be the dot product argument, or is that the dot product? That's a dot product. Okay, that's so the then, output. So the inner product is a generalization of the dot product, where instead of it necessarily being um, like you multiply the two terms together and then add them, it can be more general than that. It just has to satisfy some properties such that, you know, if you, if you take the inner product of, say, vectors u and w, it must be equal to the inner product of vectors w and u. Okay. Um, and there's a few other properties that it must satisfy. But, it, but precisely the action that is applied um, can be different. But overall, you still end up with taking a vector of some values, we'll call them scalars, mm-hmm. you take a vector of scalars, and the inner product results in a single 
scalar by by some mechanism. Okay. So then the inner product argument is a mechanism that we use. We we use it to take some large polynomial. So we encode our circuit via some mechanism into a polynomial, and we want to digest that down into a single uh, representative of you know a commitment to that polynomial. Mm-hmm. So what we do is we take the polynomial, we split it into a lower half and an upper half, and then we we can then commit to the lower and upper halves of the polynomial uh, separately, and then we fold them together with um, with some, I believe it's a random challenge that gets involved. Mm-hmm. And so then you repeat this as a sort of like a tree. And so you can think of at each step, you halve the length of the polynomial until you, you know, so like the number of coefficients in it, until at the end, you only have a single coefficient, it's like oh. a single value left. And okay, that's so every round you're doing that action. Yes, okay. exactly. So at the end, yeah, yeah, you, the folding step, like step, you take the yeah, two, yeah. the lower and upper halves and you fold them together. That's the inner product step, mm-hmm. uh, as I understand it. So at the end, you've taken something, let's say your polynomial has N like it's an n degree polynomial, it's got n coefficients, whatever. You've done log n rounds mm. because you've halved it each time. And, and why though? Like, why do you want that small, so, that smaller one? So this ends up contributing to proof size. So, so each of those rounds um, contributes um, one element to the proof, um, and so you ha- you end up with this log n uh, component to the proof if you're committing to vectors of size n. But is the, does that mean it's small? You want it to be small? Like, I guess that's the... It's smaller. Okay. So yeah. what we're trying to achieve with something like this is, you know, what the purpose of having this is that, you know, you have a proof that is sublinear in the size of the circuit. Like, if you double the size of the circuit, the size of this part of the proof does not double in size. Oh, interesting. It, it it would increase by one because doubling adds like one extra layer to the um to this inner product argument. Okay. So it's it's oh. a way to just like commit to something larger in the space of something smaller. It is it still grows with the size of the polynomial that you're um, but not that you're linearly. committing to, but lo- exactly. Okay. So it's cool. it it helps you in in certain cases with certain efficiencies. All right, my next word, polynomial IOP. Okay, so IOP is uh, an interactive oracle proof. Um, So uh, an interactive proof is where you have a protocol between uh, a prover and a verifier, and the prover is trying to convince um, the verifier um, that they know a witness for some statement. And if you have an interactive proof, then you can um, convert that into a non-interactive um, snark in this case, by a, well, in the case of Halo 2, it's um, a Fiat Shamir transformation. Mm. Um, so uh, Fiat Shamir is just where the verifier would normally send random challenges. And instead of having interactive communication with the verifier, you just have a hash function generate those challenges based on the previous transcript. So that's an interactive proof. Um, an interactive oracle proof Um, So the the verifier doesn't have to read all of the previous messages. So so we're trying to generate a more efficient protocol by replacing these long messages between the prover and the verifier um, with shorter commitments. And so this model, before we've done that optimization, we say that the verifier has Oracle access to the messages sent by the prover. And uh, that means that they can choose some position in the previous message and query that. Um, so that's interactive oracle proofs. Um, and Let's then add polynomial to the front. Exactly. Um, so if these messages are polynomials, then we can we can instantiate the oracle using a polynomial commitment scheme, basically. Mm-hmm. Which hand waving a little bit, which actually leads me a little bit to the next term, which I think we we do hear quite often is the polynomial commitment scheme. That's one that I think we've I believe we have Justin Drake did like a four three part series on polynomial commitments as a video in the study club, and I can link to that as well. But let's refresh. What's the polynomial commitment scheme? Um, in a commitment scheme, you're trying to produce some small value that commits to a larger value. 
um, and it has these properties um, called binding and hiding. Uh, the important one for, for our purposes is binding, and that says that you can't open the commitment in two different ways. Um, so the verifier can, given a purported opening, they can check that it corresponds to the commitment, and there's only one possible uh, opening that, that will satisfy that, or one that can be found. That is commitment. Yes, scheme. that's a commitment scheme. I have okay, one little side question. When you say open, what are you doing? Uh, you, you're are you doing finding, a proof? Are you like you're just... finding an input to the commitment. Okay. I the, like the output is the small value that, that you call the commitment. The, okay. There's this ambiguity in terminology sometimes. You should really say commitment scheme when you're talking about the algorithm. Okay. Um, and so a commitment is an output to that scheme. The opening is the input. Okay, cool. So now a polynomial commitment scheme. A polynomial commitment scheme is a commitment scheme to polynomials, and it also has this extra property that you can check an evaluation of the polynomial. So you can ask for the polynomial to be evaluated at a given point and check consistency with the commitment. Cool. And again, this is like this would the commitment is smaller than yes, exactly. the thing you're checking or you're committing to. Are there commitment schemes where the where it's larger? Um, I think the definition doesn't require it to be smaller. Cool. It's, it's, <laughs> it's more useful for it to be smaller. Yeah. <laughs> so there's two or three other terminology things I want to do, but I think we actually do talk about these quite often on the show. So one would be like recursion or recursive proofs. And the other would be the trusted setup. I think trusted setup, we can just point to the episodes. We can say that is the thing that Halo does away with. We don't actually need that anymore. It's an MPC. But yeah, we've done full episodes on trusted setup. So I think we'll leave that one. But recursive proofs, why don't we define those? Okay, so recursive proof, you're checking a verification of another proof. So, so your circuit in the outer proof has the verifier it's checking the verifier of some inner proof. Um, and it can check the verifications of multiple proofs. So mm -hmm. in general, you form a tree or a directed acyclic graph um, of things that you're proving, and then they can all go up to um, a single uh, proof at the top. Um, and if you check that proof and you believe in the knowledge soundness of the, um, the proof system, then you're effectively checking all of the leaf proofs. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like a it, you're compressing. Can, I mean, maybe yeah. it's the wrong term, but you're like information is then being reduced into one small thing that's pro that proves all of it. Yes, uh, an interesting thing is that it doesn't have to be just one party um, creating this tree of proofs. So um, you can collaboratively uh, form this tree, and the uh, parties that are generating the leaf proofs can know different things. Mm. So th this is important in the case of. Um, uh, Zcash or any private cryptocurrency, because um, let's suppose that you had a uh, cryptocurrency that that used um, recursive proofs pervasively, then each of the transactions representing the leaves um, would be generated by some different sender, um, and they would de know different spending keys, for example. Mm. I've also, I mean, recursive proofs or recursion. Sometimes, like I, I've also understood it just like. A proof of a proof of a proof of a proof. Yep. So like yeah, it's a so little that, bit like it's more kind of in a line. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's a special case, which is also called uh, incrementally verifiable computation, IBC. Okay. It's just a tree with a single branch. Like, and then done over and over and over again. Yeah. Or, or like, I, it's not, I really <laughs> Oh, I see like what you're the, saying, single, because okay, so, each one, like, as you go down the branch from like each Yes, just imagine having child. a tree and then you cut off every branch except one. Yeah. That's, but or, you or, still have these stop points in that, right? Yeah, it's it's actually, it's more like having like a, a it's Is it like, like having a rope? really unbalanced tree. Oh, yeah. Or it's like the rope with the knots, maybe? Or, is, that, is that what it looks like? Leaves stapled to a pole. <laughs> Okay, our metaphor. This is day three of Zcon three, so we are. And, and I really appreciate you kind of going over some of these definitions. I I followed that. I think because I'm currently kind of doing a restudy of a lot of this basic building blocks. 
I, I followed it all. I'm very happy about that. The, there are actually <laughs> competing definitions of what IVC and um, PCD, which is the, the general case, um, uh, stand for. And we, we've given basically one of them here. Um, and I, I didn't really understand the other one. Um, <laughs> at the end of the day, the core takeaway with it is that what you're trying to do with recursion or with a recursive proof is to reduce the size of what you need to verify. Mm -hmm. So if you think of having like two of your main proofs, well, you have to verify two proofs. And if you can use recursion to combine them into a single proof, then as long as the proof that you create to do that is smaller, like more efficient to verify than the two individual proofs were, then you have recursion. Got and actually, that's what's referred to as the recursion threshold. Mm -hmm. So you, there's a concept of needing a certain size of circuit to be able to verify another circuit. And for different schemes, the the recursion threshold point can be at different uh, sizes. Cool. Before we go on to how these all work together, I do want to just compare something because the inner product argument, you also had sort of reduced it to something or... You, you had, as far as I could tell, you folded it into the... Is it in a completely different part of the math from recursion? So what we did in Halo was to find a way to um, do this verification that has to happen inside the recursive circuit um, to do that in um, basically log n steps rather than n steps. So the... Um, the final verification of the inner product for the last proof, that's done by something called the decider. Um, and that costs linear time in the size of um, the outer circuit. Hmm. Um, but the part of the circuit that you need to do the recursive verification is um, I will log in. So they are similar math in terms of uh, like they're, you're all dealing in polynomials mm -hmm. here, but they are different components of it, I think, in that you know, what you're trying to build with the circuit itself and, and recursion itself is the inner product is a component of the proving system. Okay. Um, so it is something that you then need to run as part of the verifier, which then comes to um, how to do that efficiently. Um, but it is not... It is not part of the recursive proof itself. There's no requirement for an inner product argument in recursion. It mm. just so happens that the way in which uh, the Halo technique does it requires the use of an inner product argument to to work. Cool. But there are other approaches to recursion schemes that, that aren't bound to the inner product argument. So, so I think I slightly misdescribed it before. It's not that you're computing um, an inner product argument uh, within the recursive proof, it's that you're folding together um, two arguments um, in such a way that if the input arguments were valid, then the output arguments will be valid in some sense. Mm. Mm. Yeah, actually, it's it's interesting to look at because you might initially think that, oh, well, the inner product argument itself is folding. Mm -hmm. And well, if you fold the two together, do you just end up with an inner product argument directly? And in fact, no, the process of doing the folding, like the way in which we check the inner product arguments uh, collaboratively, itself is then checked in a proof that then has a completely separate inner product argument. So it's you, you do have this reduction step from two to one, but it's not that you're reducing the two inner product arguments or the multi inner product arguments from the proofs you're checking into this new one, you're just checking them in a way that means you have to produce a proof that itself has an, a separate inner product argument that it generates. Okay. Um, That's a better way of describing it than I said. <laughs> It is day three. Of, uh, yes, it is. <laughs> we both gave our talks today. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So now Halo, original Halo, came like kind of on the scene. And what did it bring? Like what was the big innovation that it brought? And I think some of the words we just defined will pop up in that. So, I mean, I think we can say there was no trusted setup. That's great. That's sort of the, the outcome. But what was happening under the hood to allow so, for that? So I think it was the... The innovation was the combination of um, being able to do recursive proofs without a trusted setup. Um, 
because the only known way to do um, recursive proofs at that point was to use these more heavyweight arguments where you were you, you had the whole um, verification circuit um, in the outer circuit to do the recursion. And the only known way to do that efficiently was to use these cycles of curves um, that are both pairing friendly. There's only one known construction that allows you to do that. It's called an MNT4, MNT6 cycle. And it requires um, curves that are quite large, um, at least 800 bits, but probably um, larger for 128-bit security, um, probably about 1,000 bits. Yeah. Um... The first time I remember this method of constructing a proof system from an IOP and a commitment scheme is when Mary Maller um, described it to me. Uh, we were in London yeah. um, and we were at this, this meetup, which was very productive. And I learned a lot about how proof systems really worked. And the example that um, Mary used was using um, KZG as the um, Orkate um, commitments for the polynomial commitment scheme. Um, and I think she was referring to Sonic, um, or she might have been referring to some some predecessor. Of, if it's the London yeah. meetup that I remember, this was the one that we went to UCL, was it? Yes. Yeah. That's the one that led to Sonic. Right, yeah. Yes. Um, this was a this was actually an ECC meetup that we just, you know, I, um, several of us, well, both Dara and myself were based in the UK and we're like, we want some some of our colleagues to come over and um and you know chat about some stuff. And so we met up with you know, Mary Muller and several others at um uh at, at a meeting. And you know, one of the presentations given, um, I think yeah, it was Mary Muller, um and I can't remember. Was it Henry de Valence? I think it might have been. Um, and I think sure. um, Sarah Michael John was there as well with yes. um, something. But I think that was a different presentation. I don't think it was Mary's one. I can't quite remember. So we had this uh, meeting and Mary gave a talk and Sean and Dara got very excited. <laughs> and I so remember. the next day, they were not at the next meeting because they were over at UCL talking with, uh, with Mary wow. about proofs. I think Ariel cool. was maybe with you as well. Uh, I can't remember. I, I do remember that she explained um, Grot 16 to us. Oh, Jens Grot was there. Oh, lovely. <laughs> what I am amazing. so glad I missed it. I mean, <laughs> one thing, you mentioned Sonics. So that was a predecessor paper. We actually had Mary on the show, mm. I think about a month or two ago, where we talked about that paper and sort of the lead up to that. That's another one I can link to in the show notes. Yeah, so, so it was that... Um, meet up and and talk that I think that's what got Sean talking with Mary uh, on this and that's um, Sean and Mary are both co-authors on the Sonic paper. Cool. Um, so when it came to Halo, um, the main reason that Halo was built around a the Sonic style polynomial IOP is because that's what we had to hand. Got it. We, the, the core innovation we were focused on was not the proving system per se, it was the recursive accumulation technique cool. um, and putting that figuring out a way to describe it so that other people would believe us that it worked yeah. uh, and the reviewers did not believe us that it worked <laughs> <laughs> yeah it uh it was a very um busy week when when sean uh messaged us and went i think i have an idea and um i had Actually, I'd flown to New York to for something else. I think I was I was doing something for ECC, and then I was going to meet up with some friends. And instead, I spent all of that week in my hotel room as we were writing code to try and prove that we could actually get this to work. Wow! <laughs> yeah, we we did not expect this property that you can do the thing that you need to do inside the verification circuit in um, logarithmic number of constraints. So, Sean just posted this problem and it was on Slack, I think. He posted this problem and asked us how to do it efficiently and, and I came up with a way of doing it efficiently. It, it, it wasn't anything spectacularly innovative. It was just the obvious way of doing it. it ended up being um, taking only logarithmic constraints. Cool. Mm. In Halo, how was the inner product argument 
you kind of talked about that combination. Was it in the halo work for the first time that you were finding that combination of the inner product argument and the recursion? So bootle proofs and bullet proofs already existed. And so we, we knew that that was a potential route to getting a transparent proving system. With this discovery that you could do the thing that you needed to do in the re recursive circuit in logarithmic time, then our previous plan had been to use pairings for part of the proof system. So, so initially, we were thinking that we would use this thing called half pairing cycles. That's where you have an efficient pairing on one curve of the cycle and the, the other part is just an ordinary curve. Um, and then you use that to get round the cycle efficiently. And then we realized because of um, this discovery that we didn't need to do that. We could use even smaller curves and we could make everything fully transparent. Mm. Yeah. So the way that then the inner product argument came into it is that fundamentally what we end up doing with Halo is uh, this concept of deferring work. So mm. if you look at what a verifier has to do to verify an inner product argument, there are components of that work that require operations on group elements of a particular elliptic curve. And there are operations that have to be done on the scalar field elements of that particular curve. Now, in the context of a circuit, it's efficient to do one or the other, but at the time it was not efficient to do both. Mm. Now, in recent years, people have figured out ways to do wrong field arithmetic that are actually like somewhat more viable, but it's still like, it is definitely more costly to do wrong field arithmetic. Um, and it can it can affect where your recursion threshold ends up. Mm. And the end result of this was that you could take an, of this um, recursion system was that you could split the inner product argument verification logic into pieces that we could just do straight away in the main verification circuit and then some deferred uh, arithmetic that you would commit to in the first uh, verification and you would take it out of the circuit as um, as a private witness and then bring it back into the next proof in the cycle where you are verifying the proof you just created and also verifying the remaining components of the previous proof. So we're essentially doing like th three proofs worth of pieces in, in wow. at once. There's in, in any particular proof that isn't the initial one in the in the recursion um, cycle, you are generating a new proof that needs verification. That proof is verifying the main body of the proof, and it is also verifying the tail end deferred pieces of the proof before that. Wow, is that was that a new technique, or had anything like that been done before? Uh, that was a up. new technique with the original Halo paper. Yeah, cool. and yeah. this was then the technique that was generalized and formalized in the... Um, BCMS 20. Yeah, BCMS 20, which um, was the paper that um, uh, Pratish presented at uh, ZCon yesterday, I think. No, um, that was a newer paper. Um, he presented well, both. He mentioned it, both. It was both. Yes. There was a, there was a twenty one paper as well. Uh, but he he mentioned he he discussed it um, at his talk yesterday. So there are there's a video to watch for that as well. Nice. Yeah, that that talk was um, well. It was about the previous paper, but it was also about um, split accumulation. Yes, which is, which a is another fun thing that yeah. they cool. then figured out on top of this idea. Very nice. Yeah. Let's uh, and it has to be said, there are other ways of doing recursion. So, for example, Plonky 2 doesn't require this um, deferred arithmetic uh, because it's using um, a Fry-based um, mm. proof system. Mm. So that doesn't require different fields. Uh, you can use the same field all the way through. What Fry-based proof system are they using? It's similar to the one used in Stark. So I think it's Deep Fry. Okay. I want to ask now about the transition to Halo 2. Like, this is a new, like, what is the difference between Halo and Halo 2? What's changing? The main difference is the arithmetization. Um, so, after and, and roughly the same time as we published the Halo paper, it was Snocktember, which was this yeah. month that was absolutely spectacular in terms of. Um, publication of, of new ideas, yeah. all of which turned out to combine really well with each other. 
I think Mikara from Hash Cloak yes. may have coined <laughs> yes. that by yeah. the way. Yeah. Shout out. They did, yes. That. <laughs> <laughs> so, so after Snark Temba, it kind of became obvious eventually that Plonk style arithmetization allowed some optimizations that weren't possible in R1CS. And so you had other proof systems adopting this plunkish arithmetization um, for efficiency gains. Mm. Yeah. Is Halo 2 plonk under the hood? Um, you, no. you just said no. plonkish, so, so let's go there. <laughs> plonk the paper yeah. and plonk the arithmetization are two separate things. Okay. So the Planck paper was a full proving system, a, a proving protocol, including an arithmetization. The same way that um, R1CS was an arithmetization introduced in um, a uh, 2013 paper, um, BCG TV, and that I believe also had a, um, a proving system that was it was deploying that, yes. that this was for. Um, so we, we just looked that up, by the way. We didn't. <laughs> We didn't remember it, so we had to look it up. <laughs> yes. Um, so, little edit in there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the Planck paper deployed a, partic a particular arithmetization. Then there were several other papers that built on it. Um, Turbo Planck, I think, was one name. Um, I've heard Ultra Planck. I don't know if that's ever made it into a paper or if it's just it's, one. There is no Ultra Planck paper. Yeah, that's but I just... think Ultra Planck is a is a term that's um, that uh, was used for like a particular instantiation. There are a lot of different things that have been used with the name Planck in it. I, yeah, I may have misheard this in my interview with Aztec, but I thought I heard Octo Planck. But I don't know if Sounds, that's real. It rings but, a bell. That is the thing. It, yeah, okay. I don't know specifically. Oh, uh, it's, it's. I think it's with eight advice columns, something oh, like that. Yeah. That I don't even know what I expected. <laughs> 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 oh, cool. So the really neat thing from the Planck paper was this Planck style arithmetization, where which essentially increased ridiculously increased the number of degrees of freedom that you have in taking your protocol, the protocol that you're trying to make a circuit about, and turning it into a circuit representable form. Mm. Um, I go into a significant amount of detail about um, these in the talk I gave this morning at ZCon 3 cool. uh, in terms of how to leverage this extra flexibility um, for performance. So the main difference, I think, between Planck and R1CS is that Planck um, gives more flexibility in the polynomial constraints that it's enforcing. Mm. So for R1CS, you're just enforcing a set of quadratic constraints. Um, so A times B equals C, where A, B, and C are linear combinations. Um, so for Planck, you can specify these things called custom gates they can equate almost an arbitrary polynomial with, with some limitation on the degree bound for efficiency to zero. And so you can use these custom gates to implement things that are very common in a particular circuit. So, so for example, suppose your circuit, like the Orchard circuit, um, consists of a bunch of Poseidon hashes and some elliptic curve arithmetic. You can define custom gates for each of those um, and they can be very efficient. And then the things that um, you only use a little bit of in your circuit, you don't need to worry so much about using custom gates for those. Although in the case of Orchard, we, we went completely overboard and defined custom gates for everything. Whoa. I, don't, I think it was fine. I, th <laughs> I, I honestly think that the, the ability to define custom constraints is like the one of the hidden superpowers of the Planck arithmetization, and it was it was not at all clear to me when I first saw the Planck paper that this was a thing it could do. And the moment I realized that, it was like, wow, this is incredible. That's so cool. So, what you've described, though, you're you're saying it's not the Planck as described in that white paper. It's taking techniques. Yes. But do you also use techniques like lookup tables? Yes. So yes. they okay. come from. Um, so yeah, the original Planck paper didn't have lookup yeah, tables. Yeah, that's newer. Yep, later ones did. So we so the Halo Two proving system does also bake in the ability to create lookup tables, um, and similarly, it um, bakes in the ability, which was another thing described in one of the Planck papers, I believe, 
to define um, global equality constraints. That was in the original paper. That that was in the original paper. Okay. So both of these are built around the idea of a permutation argument um, where you take some, say you have a, a one of your columns that you've defined as going to be, say, in an equality constraint, and you generate some sort of representative of it, and you then take the column where it's going to end up, and you generate a representative of that, and you show that these two are permutations of one another, i.e. they have the same values in them, but just in a different order. And that allows you to basically constrain that like all of these um, these cells in disparate polynomials, all mm-hmm. of these um, yeah, values represented by components of these polynomials are in fact uh, required to be the same. Cool. And the lookup argument gets a little more uh, interesting, well, um, but it we, relies on the same kind of thing under the hood. We were inspired by the lookup paper, but we actually use a different argument than the one in that paper. I think partly because I didn't fully understand the Pluckup paper at the time. Um, Do you but understand now because uh, you yes. did it another way? Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, as is often the case, um, if you know that something is possible, then you can do it in any of several ways. Cool. Um, yeah. and, and we chose a way for engineering reasons that, that was a little bit um, more compatible with the rest of um, Halo 2. Yeah, um, it is like it's slightly, I think, less efficient for certain usages of lookup tables. Um, I believe the way that lookup works, you end up you end up using like the polynomials used in the lookup tables once uh, across all of the lookups. Whereas I think in in the way that we've defined ours, you end up using the same polynomial um, if you do if you use like a subcomponent of a lookup table in multiple lookups. Um, so, for instance, the reason you might want to do this is if you and in fact we do this in Orchard if you have say a lookup table that you have you have a list of integers like from zero through to like you know 10 bit integers um so all the way to two to the 10 minus one and for each of uh, those values in your table you then have like an elliptic curve point uh, x and y coordinates so we use this for um Sinsimia, uh, our particular hash function that's optimized uh, for this kind of thing but you then also happen to have a list of numbers from 0 to 2 to the 10 minus 1. And you can use subsections of that um, column to also do um, range constraints, where you can say that something can be, say, a 10-bit value by checking it exists in that column, which is that, and that column has been baked into the circuit, so you know it's always going to be a valid 10-bit number. But yeah, the, the way that we do it, it means that we end up using that, that 10-bit column, I think, twice inside, which is slightly less efficient, but it ends up sort of uh, simpler to to implement in the back end and and reason about. Yeah. When you incorporated these techniques of Planck, was it easy? Was it like Halo's great? We're just going to switch out a little something over here, and it's going to work just fine. Or what what does that work look like when you decide to change that or yeah in- incorporate these types of techniques? So so um, a big chunk of work is just understanding the original system. Um, well enough to be able to adapt it. Okay. Um, no, it's it's not easy. And did you have to start again? Kind of. We did. You... Yes. Um, but we were going to do that anyway. I okay. think so. The original Halo implementation that we published along with the paper, um, as I mentioned, we wrote this all in a week. <laughs> Hackathon style. We are not really a fan of productionizing things that we write in a week. Mm -hmm, Fair. Um, There were certain liberties we took with the API and so on uh, in order to get a demo working, a proof of concept working. Um, But at the same time, we had come off a multi-year development process uh, for the Bellman uh, crate, which is the the Rust prover library that Sean started writing, that we've then since um, we then used for the Sapling protocol, and it's also now used for Sprout, um, and which is an R1CS based proving implementation that implements uh, yeah R1CS and then Grot16 under underneath, um, and we had learned a lot 
from both the original um, Sprout circuit and, um, and the libraries it was built with. We then learned some built on that in Bellman. And so we were taking the API uh, designs and techniques and like for safety and, and performance circuit building that we learned from that. And we wanted to take those and apply them uh, with the Halo technique and Plonk as the component and sort of you know mix them all together and build a, a proving system that was designed from the ground up to work um, with these components. I, I think actually we underestimated the complexity of the API that was needed to handle Plonkish rhythmization, especially, Absolutely. especially some of the abstractions that we built on top, like regions, gadgets, chips, um, which are described in Strad's talk at Zcon 3. So yes, we, we very much underestimated that, but I'm very happy with how it's turned out now. We've got multiple groups um, building on the Halo 2 crates and they seem to be having a lot of success. Mm. Cool. Yeah, the the end result of what we've sort of ended up with um, is that we have, so we have the Planck style arithmetization that we use we with the quality constraints and our lookup argument um, similar to PLOOKUP. Um, and then that gets boiled down into a series of polynomials per the way that Planck uh, arithmetization works. Mm. Once you have those polynomials, then it transitions into sort of a more um, traditional. I mean, the how how long have people considered this traditional? How how long does it have to be before uh, <laughs> <laughs> before we consider it uh, folklore? Um, but the but a similar technique to m many other proving systems of taking so we take the polynomial we want to constrain that that grand polynomial that, that contains all of our circuit to be zero so we do so by proving that you can divide it by a target polynomial um, and show that there is no remainder that's that's the traditional traditional way that's done for like grot sixteen proofs do this. Um, I forget precisely it's the details. It's a vanishing of, point? It's a vanishing argument, yes, that we okay. use here. I forget specifically the details of how ours is built. We had to do a few trickeries here and there to make um, certain things work within degree bounds um, because there are limitations to the sizes of polynomials that we can work with in certain um, areas of the, of the proof. So we had to be a little careful in terms of how certain degree uh, bounds of polynomials were lined up. And so if you think of how Planck, like you can have a concept of like rows and columns for Planck. And so you have the the number of rows ties to the, the degree of that polynomial. And then the maximum degree of any of the con custom constraints in your circuit, you multiply those two together, you end up with an extended degree, like a of degree, like, you know, number of rows times um, maximum degree approximately and so you have to work in an extended domain to do computations of those polynomials and it isn't always efficient to do that so there are areas where the polynomial is sort of like broken up and adjusted to um, to sort of make the vanishing argument work. Mm. Um, yeah and uh, there was some difficulty in um, getting that to work properly with zero knowledge mm. in such a way that we could prove zero knowledge rigorously. Mm. Yeah we had we had one version of that and then once the security proof um, for zero knowledge got to the point that it was like okay um, we we now know that like we are unable to prove that the thing we're doing here is secure. We went and did a slightly less efficient thing um, in that part of the vanishing argument to make sure that we could ensure that the thing that we were going to deploy was provably um, zero knowledge. It's, it's interesting that um, a zero knowledge bug, um, it's, it's mainly a theoretical bug rather than something that is actually exploitable. Uh, a zero knowledge bug was found in the original uh, Planck paper mm -hmm. and that affected um, quite a few implementations. Um, uh, that's all public now, so I'm not revealing any security flaws that aren't already known. Mm. But that also there is like there's a, there's that comes also back to Plonk the paper also had a proving system and so implementing that proving system from the paper had that whereas thing whereas proofing systems that had the Plonk arithmetization but had their own proofs under the hood were sort of they were separate uh, from that. Are there any other innovations highlights that you say Halo Two is bringing to the table? Maybe optimizations mm. techniques. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, the thing I like to, so like Halo 2, as I was, as we were describing before, is like the actual components of it are 
independently reasonably well understood from a theoretical perspective. Um, I think the the remaining piece um, that was left after doing the vanishing argument is just um, you have to take that and do some evaluations and then do an opening argument to show they're constrained, and then that ties into the inner product argument at the end. Those are all like relatively well understood on their own, but the thing that isn't well understood is how to actually use the Planck arithmetization efficiently. Um, there have been various people working with um, with Planck arithmetizations in, in the ecosystem and us coming into it and going, we have a strong need to be able to build very performant circuits. We have um, very specific performance requirements that uh, that we need to meet. And in particular here, we had an overarching desire for the performance of um, the circuit orchard that we built with it to not be horribly worse than the existing sapling um, circuit that uh, that was used because we want it to be possible to for people to migrate and, and still be able to use it the way that they use sapling. Yeah, and a lot of the, the work that ended up happening sort of fell into a couple of main categories. The, the first one was just building all of the primitives because you know there were no gadgets um, that were that were reusable in this way. Um, you know, we had to build all the the elliptic curve arithmetic uh, gadgets were the <laughs> worst. <laughs> Ying Tong did absolutely amazing work um, yes, building at, those. At really spectacular. Um, yeah. Ying Tong. And yeah, between those, and then you know you had things like Poseidon and you know the Merkle gadgets and, and Smear on top of that, and like there was a lot of that low level work to do. At the same time, as we were building those, we were looking at the kinds of things we were building and going, well, that looks awful. How can we make this better? And so doing sort of, and we were using the development of our circuit as sort of a, a feedback loop for developing the APIs to use to develop the circuit. Wow. Um, and you know, coming up with, you know, figuring out, okay, what kinds of things are we repeating? What kinds of abstractions can we build to um, to make this easier to work with? And so, like um, as Dara alluded to earlier, um, one of the core things that we introduced was this this concept of a region. So, if you think of Planck the table as a whole, like you know, your full circuit defined there. Um, we we define a small like bounded rectangle within that where we say okay in this region um, the relative offsets that you can use with like um, Planck constraints you know custom constraints they're guaranteed to be preserved because one of the things that you have with Planck is that your your constraints are effectively two dimensional unlike R one CS where you, you know, they they are minimally interacting with each other. Mm. And so enabling you know, the use of that for, for low-level packing, um, you can do that within, within this definition of region, and you can do that in the, in the API in a relatively straightforward way. Um, but by introducing that concept, we could then start doing automated optimizations uh, on, over the, you know, around that mm. and start building that. So it was a lot of the work went into starting to try and build the, the tool chains for doing these like automated, almost like a compiler pass. And there's definitely a lot of influence on our API design and thinking that has come from both the regular like compiler toolchain world mm. and also the um, the CPU architecture design, like designing silicon chips or FPGAs world. Um, both of them sort of feed their way into like circuit design is almost both of them at once. And Weird, though. Wait, when you say this, the, the way you're using the word compiler, is this using it just in the building of the system or is this in the act in the activity that's happening while it's proving so anything that transforms sort of one expression of a program or a statement into another expression is a compiler okay so is it in the building thinking like the way you're developing it that you're using this compiler tool no what we're building is the compiler tool to be used within the protocol within the, within, within well it's in intermediate so 
the thing that we're building is you know the proving system i e the actual physical like binary that that grinds and generates mm. the proofs you know you give it a circuit you give it some implementation of a of a circuit and you need to go from that circuit into a form that that you can make with proofs and, and that that's, the, that's the compilation okay. step effectively now we don't actually have explicit like compiler passes yet it's figuring out basically where these optimizations can fit and how you can work with mm. them. Because sort of the what we really started from was actually looking more at like the FPGA side of things and going, okay, this is really an area optimization problem. Because like, you know, if you, the ideal is to have as few rows and as few columns as possible. So if you need to use a certain amount of rows and columns, how do you use them most efficiently? Mm. And that packing problem is where you start going looking at these optimizations and doing like potentially multiple rounds of run a thing see how it packs learn something about the circuit you know try something else we at the moment only have some very relatively simple optimization passes implemented because they were sufficient for what we needed uh, for our use for the orchard circuit but the general idea that we're sort of trying to trying to bring about here uh, in at least the Halo 2 toolchain is that both you can choose how you want to build your circuits in terms of the efficiencies you want to have, mm. um, while also not having to do most of that optimization work yourself. And so we can start reusing the learnings that you know we and other circuit developers have, have accumulated over the years. Um, do you actually just this is a bit of an aside, but do you have like have you created a new DSL for any of this, or are you using Bell? Because you mentioned Bellman, is it still Bellman? Or it is still the Bellman-like API. So we do not have a DS. Well, we don't have a DSL. We have a series of Rust APIs that can be used to build circuits. Okay. So that is actually one of the things we would very much like to have. We just don't have anyone who has the time to build DSLs on our team. Yeah. There's also, there are a lot of DSLs, so you might want to see uh, if there's any out there. Yeah, we, we probably want to reuse a DSL. For yeah. Someone I, else as well. We certainly have people who would very much like to build DSLs. Uh, note I said, have the time to do so. <laughs> um, yeah. The, so as I was saying before, the traditional notion of a compiler, you, you have... Um, a text file that um, has a program in some language and you um, run it through the compiler and you produce a binary. Um, but the the input doesn't have to be a text file. It can be called to an API and the output doesn't have to be a binary. It can be um, some in-memory data structure that you're using for your proof system. Mm. Cool. Yeah, like right now, the, the situation is that you can't actually do this fully at runtime because we made some simplifications, again, to try and a little bit limit the complexity of Plonk because there is so much that you can do with it. Um, so there were a few things that we required circuit developers to configure by hand, um, namely the number of columns and then uh, which columns are being used by which sub-components, which you know, uh, chips used within gadgets and so on, terminology that uh, that uh, we also sort of like came up with some other abstractions um, mm -hmm to sort of, again, help help with um, configurability. But one of the next things we want to do is enable those to be configured at runtime so then we can both start doing wider range optimizations, horizontal optimizations in addition to vertical, and be able to take in um, circuit definitions from outside the process, for example, um, from an intermediate language that some other DSL has produced. So Strad mentioned what we call floor planning, which is moving around regions to pack them uh, tightly um, into fewer rows and columns. Uh, there's also something called selector combining. Um, so selectors are what you use to turn on or off particular um, custom gates at, at different rows of the circuit. And so what you end up with in a circuit, especially like Orchard, that has lots of different um, custom constraints is you end up with lots of, of these binary selectors. Um, and so we have this um, uh, optimization. Originally, I tried to do this optimization manually and then we decided that, it didn't, that didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. We could do a better job doing it automatically where you um, combine several selectors into a single column, and then you reconstruct um, the original selectors by interpolation from the, the compressed selector. Cool. 
And that reduces your proof size because you have fewer columns. There's other ones we've discussed and had it thinks, thought about over time, but uh, that we haven't got implemented yet. So okay. there's more fun that can be had cool. in the future. Like Halo 2, it's comparable, I guess, then to Plonky 2. Well, how do those kind of match up? Um, so I guess um, Halo 2 produces smaller proofs and Plonky 2 has a faster prover. I haven't actually compared them rigorously, so I, I don't want to make too strong statements about it. I'm really enthusiastic that we have some competition between proof systems, and Plunky 2 is also able to do recursion. Um, it's simpler in some ways because it doesn't um, require the deferred arithmetic, um, and it's post-quantum secure. So even if you have this trade-off with proof size, um, there are applications for which you would definitely want to use um, Plunky 2. Cool. Mm. And there's also potentially interesting like um, cooperation that can occur between these. So you saw a bit in the in the R1CS era, as we can call it now. Is it over? Uh, yes. <laughs> There's still a lot I, of Graph 16 out there. It, <laughs> I mean, you can build a um, Plonk a, a plunk arithmetization that, that hooks into Graph 16 if you really want to. Mm. Um, we saw that a lot of um, work being done to say, like, take your DSL and use it to compile that down to some, you know, some encoding of R1CS, you know, via a front end that you could then pass that to a back end tool to do the to do the final proving, and. I could definitely see something similar happening happening here. For example, if you know, if I've not looked at Plonky 2's um, APIs, but if people preferred programming in those versus ours, you could imagine though, they, if they wanted to produce our kinds of proofs, that Plonky 2 might be able to you know run through, take things through its API and generate some intermediate um, representation Ooh. that then gets passed across to the Halo 2 as a as a backend that could then run through our optimization pass. Similarly, or vice versa, or vice versa, mm. and you could even I could even see a thing where Halo 2 proving uh, logic is split into three where you have the ability at like you have our current rust apis and you have either a layer just below that or maybe at the same layer that lets you take in arbitrary circuit definitions you then have our optimization logic that we have which goes from the circuit that the user has to find to the circuit intended to be equivalent Asterisk, asterisk, we really you know, have to be careful in the optimizations we implement, um, representation of the circuit, and then take that and port that over to, say, Plonky 2 or some other system for final production of the proof that you care about. Wow. So this would enable different teams to sort of like work on the things that they are good at and and leverage, you know, um, leverage the other work that is being done in a, in a more modular way. I love that idea. I want to wrap up on Orchard. So you've mentioned it a few times, but we haven't really talked about what that is doing. I mean, this is the upgrade. Mm. The new shielded protocol. For the Zcash, new shielded yes. protocol. And the last one was Sapling. That's yep. right. And that one, if I remember correctly, Sapling was the introduction of Graph 16. Yes. And so we is this replacing that part then? Is Halo 2 instead of? So, so some history, um, remember that the proof system that we originally used for Sprout called um, BCTV14 um, had a soundless floor. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we could have um, fixed just that soundless floor, but instead we decided to, um, to move to GROT16, um, partly for efficiency reasons as well. And Sean re-implemented the Sprout circuit on um, GROT16. So both Sprout and Sapling now use that. Um, and then when we moved to Orchard, uh, and then when we've introduced Orchard, um, that's using Halo 2, and the, the previous um, shielded protocols are still using Grot 16. Yeah. Oh, okay, so you're using both. Yes. yes. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so if you if you want to interact with the Zcash protocol without involving pairings and the, the parameters and, and whatever, then you can just interact with the the new orchard pool, and you are only relying on the um, trustless proving system there. You, is it because you, like is it the way it's built? You can't switch that over without losing somehow the balances. So Grot sixteen needs pairing friendly curves, and so it's more efficient to keep um, Sprout and Sapling using uh, Grot sixteen on the job job curve and BLS twelve three eight one. Um, uh, Sprout doesn't actually use any elliptic curve arithmetic at all. It uses... Um, it's inefficient functions. everywhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, 
Uh, but implementing the sapling shielded protocol on Halo 2 using the pasta curves, that would be inefficient because that would require you to do wrong field arithmetic. So that's why we've stuck with GROT16 and um, BLS12, 381 and Does each you know, Does each upgrade have its own pool? Like, is there still a sprout and yes. a sapling? And, oh, wow. Okay, I didn't yeah. realize it was... Like yeah, that. the... You could, in fact, have more, but the more than one pool if you really wanted to. Mm. Um, Nathan gave a talk where he proposed that idea, um, and has done in the past. Um, but for now, what we currently have is each shielded protocol has its own um, pool of shielded pool. So if you want to move funds from one uh, shielded protocol to a different shielded protocol, you have to first you, you do them separately. You take it out of one still within a single transaction, but you take it out of one pool and then put it into the other one by making two proofs, one from each. Um, this has a couple of benefits, which is that we don't have to change the old pool's logic uh, at all um, to be aware of the new pool, and the new pool's design doesn't have to take on any baggage protocol, you know, tech debt, debt from the original, no, the previous pool's um, design. Plus then you get some insulation um, between the two. Yeah, you, you can completely change the cryptography if you want to, as, as we have done for Orchard. Yeah. Mm. One way to think about Orchard is that, like, if you understand sapling, you understand Orchard. Um, Orchard is essentially, what if we implement the sapling protocol, but we change the root of spend authority mm. to be a recursion-friendly curve? Almost every design decision um, that in which sapling and orchard differ is a result of that decision. Mm. As Dara said, um, implementing sapling with its existing curves on top of uh, the new curves would be inefficient. So we wanted to just do the sapling protocol rather than the sapling pool in the new curves. And that's what gives rise to orchard. I, I mean, we started with that idea, but we couldn't resist making a few <laughs> design changes for, just for cleaning up things that we that I think we did wrong in sapling. Okay. Um, it, it's mainly just cleaning up um, things like the key structure to uh, strengthen the properties that we have from viewing keys, um, some optimizations like using a commitment scheme to generate um, IVK from a full viewing key instead of a hash, um, things like that. We, we also paid a lot of attention to maintaining the privacy properties of the protocol um, mm -hmm. against a, a quantum adversary who doesn't know the addresses. Is Orchard, like, is there a benefit to this upgrade in terms of performance or is there like something else that's happening that the users may notice or that the, like, does it have higher capacity? What's, like, um, why do an upgrade? Uh, so it, it's future proofing basically, because we, we know that we will um, want to use recursion. And so we wanted to switch to curves that would support that. Um, there are other things that we've introduced in the NU5 upgrade, sort of in parallel with Orchard, for example, unified addresses, which allow you to specify an address from more than one pool um, that looks like a single address to a user. And also um, a new transaction version, V5 transactions, uh, which have non-malleable transaction IDs. So this is um, something that was um, implemented for um, Bitcoin in SegWit. Uh, we've taken a slightly different design approach, but the, the effect is the same. Yeah. There are a few things that users would notice about Orchard itself. Um, for certain kinds of transactions, Orchard proving is faster. Um, for other kinds, it is slower because we. one of the things we did was we, we moved to the model where you make a single proof, like a single action, which is for both an input and an output. So one of the things we had done in Sapling was separated them so that you could make cheaper output proofs more easily. But uh, the cost of that was then that you 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 didn't have arity hiding between uh, spends and outputs. So, well, for efficiency purposes, uh, effectively, you could you could add a bunch of outputs um, with a few spins, and you can tell that like it is few spins, many outputs, rather than many spins, few outputs. Mm. With Orchard, going back to an action model similar to what Sprout had. Um, now, if you want to pay to many outputs, you could also have feasibly had many inputs. Um, so it gives us a bit more arity hiding compared to uh, to sapling proofs. And as far as the spend proofs go, the, the spend side is more efficient effectively overall um, in Orchard. Cool. 
I want to say thank you so much for doing this dive into Halo 2. Dara knows this. I've been trying to get this episode to happen for, I think, almost eight months. Yeah. So I really, really am so happy that we've gotten a chance to sit down and dive into it. I'm definitely leaving with a much, much better understanding of sort of the challenges of doing these kinds of changes, even though it sounds like just put plonkish stuff in technique, yay. <laughs> but actually, so much work has to go into it. And yeah, thanks for sharing so much about the work you've been doing. And thanks for doing the work. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Yeah, I'm very happy to ramble. <laughs> cool. It's been, it's been a pleasure both to, to implement new fun cryptography, although it took us a long, a long time uh, longer than we thought. Mm. Um, it's been a pleasure to do that and um, to, to do this podcast with you. Cool. Yes, and I'm, I'm very excited for more people to learn about it and, and the stuff that, uh, that has been done there because I want more people to be doing this kind of thing in their own proving systems and implementations. Um, you know, yeah, more efficiencies, m you know, more optimizations that, that people don't have to do by hand uh, because doing things by hand is very error prone and, uh, and more developer tooling for people to figure out what's going on when they're doing so. Very and the cool. next step is definitely higher level languages. Oh, yes. Nice. Which we somehow keep avoiding ourselves. But uh. <laughs> Cool. Well, thank you so much. I want to say thank you to the ZCon 3 folks for letting us have this room to be able to record this episode. I want to say thank you to the ZK podcast team, Tanya, Rachel, and Henrik, and to our listeners. Thanks for listening. Thank you.